Hello, Gil Tamari from Israel Television Channel 10. The people in Israel are wondering if you are elect president, are you going to be a big supporter of Israel like President Bush is, or are you going to exert a different uh, policy? Well, I think I have been and will continue to be a very strong supporter of Israel. Israel is our, our ally. Israel is a fellow democracy. Israel uh, has had bipartisan support from presidents of both parties, from Congresses, and from the American people uh, since its founding. That will continue because we ultimately must let the world know that we stand with Israel, we guarantee Israel's security. Uh, that is a policy that will never change. You know, Israel will be to Gaza today. We just want to get your thoughts on that. Just a quick question. Yeah. I am not Israeli. The uniform that I wore in the military, unfortunately, was not an Israeli uniform. It was an American uniform, although my wife was in the IDF, and one of my daughters was in the IDF, and my two little boys, our two little boys, one of whom will be bar mitzvah tomorrow, hopefully he'll come back. Thank you. Hopefully he'll come back, his hobby is shooting, and uh, he'll come back and be a sniper <laughs> for, the, uh, for the IDF. I'm getting orders. I think it's the worst negotiating ploy tactic anybody could imagine. Right, so you would support negotiations with Iran currently so long as they first seized all enrichment of uranium? No. What do you mean, support negotiation? What are we going to negotiate about? You what I would say is, listen, you see that desert out there? I want to show you something. So you pick up your cell phone, even at, uh, even at uh, traveling rates. You pick up your cell phone, and what are they called? Roaming charges. Roaming charges. <laughs> uh, you pick up your cell phone, and you call somewhere in Nebraska, and you say, okay, let it go. So there's an atomic weapon goes over ballistic missiles in the middle of the, middle of the desert that doesn't hurt a soul. Maybe a couple of rattlesnakes and scorpions or whatever. And then you, and then you say, see, the next one is in the middle of Tehran. So we mean business. You want to be wiped out? Go ahead and take a tough position and continue with your nuclear development. You want to be peaceful? You want to be peaceful? Just reverse it all, and we will guarantee you that you can have a, a, a nuclear power plant for electricity purposes. Friend, so. So, no, no so a tremendous with, demonstration of American strength, so that they would get the, the message. The only that, thing they understand. And do you see the current negotiations as a demonstration of weakness? Absolutely. When I first uh, went to Congress, I did not go to Congress to um, pay particular attention to any area outside of the black community that I represented that was in need. And of course, uh, U.S. Africa policy, which was abhorrent and unfortunately still is. Um, but what I ran into, I bumped into at almost every turn were these special interests. And there's no more special interest that has any more influence than the pro-Israel lobby. And so then when I did outreach, for example, to the Muslim community in the United States, uh, I bumped into the pro-Israel lobby, which of course does not want to have to contend with a politicized Muslim community, which is as large as and is as wealthy as the pro-Israel lobby is in the United States. So yes, I um, 
uh, first handedly and also frontally <laughs> was uh, uh, assaulted by the presence of the pro-Israel lobby to such an extent physically assaulted well politically assaulted okay. to such an extent that my father had to ask the question publicly what does Stone Mountain Georgia have to do with Israel what I was doing was servicing the needs of my constituents and I was not allowed to do that because I did not toe the line on U.S. policy for Israel. What line is that that they wanted? Were you told directly that you had to toe a line or explain that to me? Well, every candidate for Congress at that time had a pledge. They were given a pledge to, to sign. And I was uh, new on the scene. And uh, so the pledge had Jerusalem as the capital city, uh, the military superiority of Israel. American Congress people have to sign this pledge. Yes, you sign the pledge. If you don't sign the pledge, you don't get money. So for example, it was almost like uh, water torture for me. My parents observed this. I would get a call and uh, the person on the other end of the phone would say, I want to do a fundraiser for you. And then we would get into the planning. I would get really excited because, of course, you have to have money in order to run a campaign. And then two weeks, three weeks into the planning, they would say, did you sign the pledge? And then I would say, no, I didn't sign the pledge. And then my fundraiser would go kaput. I made it public. This probably nobody had said anything about it. but. I made it public and then, you know, the excuse was, well, you know, those were just overzealous uh, ag advocates for Israel. So then the tactic changed. And uh, but this is what is done for 535 members of the United States Congress. 100 senators, 435 members of the House of Representatives have to now write a paragraph which basically says the same thing so it's not a pledge but it's a paragraph and you post it and you know there are these forums you have to go to at the synagogues or whatever and then you know if you don't perform appropriately then you don't get money to run your campaign the problem is that it requires an awful lot of money to run a campaign and whether it's a woman's organization, an environmental organization, people can read about this on the internet if they're interested. If you go to uh, thomas.loc.gov, that is the official United States Congress website. And if you put in the name uh, Gus Savage, because Gus Savage was a black member of Congress, who was targeted by the pro-Israel lobby. And he had the foresight to use his position as an incumbent in the House of Representatives to put his experience on the congressional record for the entire existence of the United States Congress now, people will be able to access his experience. And what he wrote was that it was the Garden Club of New Jersey that gave his opponent five thousand dollars but it wasn't really the garden club of new jersey it was the activists who were associated with apac the okay. american israel public affairs committee well the district that i initially represented in congress i represented so many districts because redistricting was a tool that was used to target me to eliminate me from the congress but the district that initially sent me there was a district that was comprised of rural blacks in the in the black belt of Georgia. These are people who have not had access to equal opportunity at all. The the district was uh, challenged in the Supreme Court, and with the assistance of the Anti Defamation League, the district was dismantled. It generally takes about two hundred fifty thousand dollars minimum to take a case um, from filing up to the Supreme Court. And the people who
filed the the lawsuit to dismantle the they challenged my ability to represent the people of that particular district who and, were these people well uh, actually interestingly there were five white citizens one of whom had been the white male candidate that I defeated in the Democratic primary. And um, they were aided and abetted by the Anti-Defamation League. And um, when the case arrived at the Supreme Court, interestingly, on the same day as the an environmental case, the Spotted Owl case, the Supreme Court decided that the habitat for the Spotted Owl, owl should be protected but that the black voters in that district could have no protection and so the district was dismantled well i have um because of the notoriety about me telling my story and then of course uh the public positions that i've taken supporting the human rights aspirations the the legitimate rights and the aspirations of the palestinian people um I have a target on my forehead and that then means that every means that is available to the pro-Israel lobby will be utilized to make sure that I do not ever occupy a position of authority. Now fortunately for me there is a very large peace community that is interested in change. And they would like to have a tested, experienced voice representing them in that very hall of Congress so that they can at least have their voices heard, even if they can't change the policy. But being there is the first step to having the policy changed. Ladies and gentlemen, we must always remember three things. First, Iran. Second, Iran. And third, Iran, 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 again and again. Like, first, Iran. Second, Iran. And third, Iran, Iran, Iran. Stand, down, stand, down, stand, down. Twice, not once, twice. The Benjamin Netanyahu address was 10% uh, speaking, 90% clapping. In fact, there wasn't a chair in the room that got warm for even a minute. But that was not enough for some people. The Washington Post's uh, Jennifer Rubin said that one man in particular had not been nearly as clappy as he should have been. Uh, that is Rand Paul. Here are some of the tweets that she sent out, uh, culled from many tweets that she sent attacking Rand Paul. Uh, so he sent out saying something that he was in support of Israel. Uh, she said, then why would you seriously contemplate containment or propose a budget that cuts aid, including aid to Israel? She said he was unenthused. He was lifelessly applauding Bibi. Oops, almost like he's been faking his support for Israel until now. Ooh, with admirable retweet numbers there. She's doing pretty well for herself on Twitter. She said Paul's staff uh, complains that he clapped plenty during the speech. Fair. Real question should be about record and positions. But that is after multiple tweets saying that that man had not clapped nearly enough. Yeah, I thought maybe that she meant the position of his claps. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, he, okay, fine, he did clap over 50 times, that's not bad, mm -hmm. but not enthusiastically. And he did a little to the right when it should a have been little a little bit. to the You got to cup it, keep the air in so it really it echoes throughout the room. He didn't do enough of enthusiastic meathead claps like this. Oh, let's go, BB! Let's go! B-I, 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 B-I! I would have liked to have seen a woo, 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 woo. That would have shown proper enthusiasm yeah. for a foreign leader. No Arsenio Hall not at all. at all. And you know he watched that show back in the day. <laughs> Okay, look, look at how absurd this is, man. Look at how crazy this is. In America, if a United States senator does not enthusiastically enough applaud a foreign leader mm -hmm. while in the midst of giving him a standing ovation uh -huh. over 50 times, yeah. not good enough. You didn't bow down enough uh, to Israel's prime minister. Yeah. And these are the guys who ironically say, Obama gave a slight bow to like the Japanese <laughs> leader or the Saudi leader, and of course Bush used to make out with the Saudi leader. They forgot that, mm -hmm. but anyway, yeah. but but like, how dare you bow to a foreign leader? And they're like, why weren't you on the ground groveling in front of Netanyahu's feet? Yeah, 
But can I take it slightly over the top? We have seen this in a very classic piece of literature. It was George Orwell's uh, 1984. And during the two-minute hate, you were worried that someone would look at you and you would not have enough passion and anger on your face that they would judge you. And perhaps the government would come and seek you out and take you in for not having the right uh, frame of mind. And that's what Jennifer Rubin is doing here to Rand Paul, a man who, I bet if you went down the list, nine out of ten positions specific to Israel, he shares her position. But it is not enough because he kind of like glanced down. Maybe he didn't have enough coffee that morning. Besides which, who cares? Yeah. Who cares? How did she and, notice? Okay, no, no, no. This is totalitarian. You're absolutely right about that. And by the way, it's not just a, a, a reference to literature. It just happened. It happened in North Korea when uh, Kim Jong Il passed uh. away. There was the weeping in the streets and the signs of grief. And that totalitarian government was looking at the tapes to see who didn't cry enough, mm -hmm. okay? And then there were consequences. We did the story on the show. There were consequences if you did not grieve enough yeah. when the dear leader passed away. In this <laughs> case, our dear leader isn't even our leader. Yeah. It's somebody else's leader. And if you don't grovel to him enough, if you're not like, yes, baby. You should have to switch your pants halfway through the speech. They should have a short little break. Where you switch your pants, you come back in fresh, ready for the, the conclusion. Yeah, this is... Unbelievable. Yeah. I have never seen a country that has given over its sovereignty mm -hmm. as much as uh, we see in, the, in an instance like this. Yeah. I mean, these are the guys who are constantly talking about our U.S. sovereignty! Unless, of course, it's Israel, in which case, so, screw our leader. Let's not only do every single thing that the other leader says, a mm -hmm. foreign leader says, but you must, but we're watching you. And if you're not enthusiastic enough as you're kissing his hand, ring, <laughs> uh, then there will be consequences. Yeah. Okay, so, but and, let's talk briefly. You know what, I'm sorry, one more thing. Okay. These are the same guys who say uh, that political correctness is wrong. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine a better definition of political correctness. And how much Can you clap? imagine if the liberals said, uh, while Obama was uh, uh, giving the State of the Union, uh, some people were not clapping enthusiastically enough, we need you to clap harder. <laughs> they would be like, oh, totalitarian state propaganda, political correctness. That's the sort of enthusiasm I want to see out of Rand Paul, which you just demonstrated right yeah. there. All right. So we do have Rand Paul. He was asked about this brought by Brian Kilmeade, who's always just doing his best. Uh, and here is Rand Paul's response. You don't have a monitor here, but we have some of your reaction during the speech, and you look less than thrilled hearing the speech. And as we roll it back, let me tell you what the National Review said. Uh, out, uh, San, uh, Rand Paul's outspoken views against far, uh, muscular foreign policy and, uh, and foreign aid. Uh, you look less than enthused while the prime minister spoke. What's, uh, how, what were you thinking? You know, I think what's funny about it is that you have these gossipy websites who really demean themselves by putting stuff like that out. I, I gave the prime minister 50 standing ovations. I co-sponsored bringing him here. And on the day that I also decided to co-sponsor the Corker bill that says any final deal has to be approved, uh, we have gossipy websites looking at, you know, the metric of how fast you clap. I mean, I think they demean themselves by putting that out. Alison uh, Weir is the president of the Council on National Interest and the executive director of uh, If Americans Knew, which is a think tank uh, dedicated to informing people about the Middle East and its conflict. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Alison Weir. Thank you. Where, where and how did this all start? And how did the U.S. get such a uniquely special relationship with a tiny country without resources? How did this happen? Well, one of the first things I learned was that when, when I was born, there was no Israel. So where did this come from? Well, what I discovered was that there was a movement uh, that began over a century ago and began operating in Europe and in the United States. It was, a, was and is a political movement that has profoundly and negatively impacted our country. It has tragically impacted the Middle East 
and it has dangerously impacted the entire world. And yet most of us, I think, have never heard of it and could certainly not define it. It's political Zionism. This was a movement to create a Jewish state in Palestine. It began in the late 1800s. Well, let us look at Palestine in the late 1800s. It was what we largely think of now as a somewhat multicultural land in that it was about 80% Muslim, about 15% Christian, and about 5% Jewish, all living together quite successfully. There are mosques, synagogues, uh, churches throughout Palestine, throughout the Middle East, and throughout North Africa. These populations had been living without conflict for centuries. But this movement was, was created largely in Israel, uh, largely in Europe, and then taken up at the same time in the US to create a Jewish state on land that was already inhabited in which 95% were not Jewish. Therefore, this would involve, and this was known by the leadership, even though many followers didn't know it, this would mean that 95% of those people were going to be dispossessed by money, if possible, by force, if necessary. This was written in, in Zionist journals early on. Now, my book and my talk concentrates on the US aspect of all of this. What surprised me in my research is how early and how active this movement was in the United States, a movement I'd never heard of, although I was born here, and my parents were born here, and some ancestors go back to the beginning. It turns out that this was a very significant movement long before my parents were born. And then by 1910, there were already 20,000 Zionists in the US. They included lawyers, professors, and businessmen. It was already in 1910 a movement to which congressmen listened. Then in 1912, we had a very significant development. A prominent lawyer named Louis Brandeis became a Zionist. Brandeis not only just be, didn't just become a Zionist, within about two years, he then became the head of world Zionism. This was, a pub, this was public, it's not some secret knowledge, it's just that most of us don't know it. And then within a few years, he was also a Supreme Court Justice, named by Woodrow Wilson. When you're a Supreme Court Justice, you're supposed to resign your various board memberships and affiliations because you're supposed to not have any conflict of interest but be neutral. So he did resign his leadership of world Zionism, but in reality, he continued it. He would receive reports in his Supreme Court chambers by his loyal lieutenants, and then he would give them directives to go out and to uh, follow in work for Zionism. And this is mentioned in a number of very reliable books. If you get my book, you'll see that my book is over half footnotes. It's all cited. By the way, one of his loyal lieutenants also went on to become a very prominent Supreme Court Justice, Felix Frankfurter. So I'd read that. That to me was shocking right there. But then I discovered something more. So I'll give you my citations for this next information so you can evaluate whether you find it reliable or not. I, the way I did my research is I, I would read books, then I would look at their footnotes to see where they had gotten that information. Then I would often get those books and read those footnotes and then order those books and read those footnotes and on and on. So one of the books that I read was re really a fairly well-known one. Israel in the Mind of America, published by a very mainstream establishment publisher, and the author was a very mainstream author. He had been diplomatic correspondent for the New York Times, he had been at Harvard, he'd written a number of well-regarded, very establishment nonfiction books. Well, in this book, he had a few pages in which he told about a secret Zionist society that had operated in the United States of which Louis Brandeis, while a Supreme Court Justice, had been a leader. So I looked at where he got that information and I went to that source. It turned out to be from a scholarly journal 
called the American Jewish Historical Quarterly, a very respected journal. So then I looked at the author. Well, is this a reliable author? Who wrote this very, to me, explosive information and turned out to be a, a well-regarded Israeli historian at a, a mainstream uh, Israeli university. She had written an article in 1975 called The Parashim, a secret episode in American Zionist history. Uh, and she told about what this was, an elitist secret society. The word meant Pharisees and separate. They would go around the country and influence people to push the Zionist agenda. By the way, at this time, the Jewish population were not Zionists at all. The large majority were not Zionists. Many were opposed to Zionism. This was a, a very, very fringe uh, element to a certain regard. Then in this secret society, they even had a secret induction ceremony so that when somebody joined this society, and many, their membership included professors and Harvard, you know, recent Harvard graduates and uh, doctors, significant people around the country were sometimes members. And in this initiation ceremony, they were told by the inductor, and they swore to this, until our purpose shall be accomplished, you will be the fellow of a brotherhood whose bond you will regard as greater than any other in your life, dearer than that of family, of school, of nation. As early as November 1915, a leader of the Parashim went around suggesting that the British might gain some benefit from a formal declaration in support of a Jewish national homeland in Palestine. Those of you who have heard of the Balfour Declaration that came in 1917 might find this relevant. I'll get into that a little bit more. Let's remember what was going on during this time period now in the world, especially that involved Britain. Well, of course, in 1914 began what was called at that time the Great War of massive carnage. British forces in the first day of the Battle of the Somme lost, according to historians, somewhere around 50,000 to 60,000 men in one day of a battle that went on and on and on. The British and the German, both sides of course, wanted the US to come in on their side to join this carnage. But the American population were that bad thing, they were isolationists. They didn't want to go kill and be killed in a foreign pointless war. In fact, Woodrow Wilson was elected with the slogan, he kept us out of the war. But of course, as you know, with hindsight, no, he didn't. Well, what happened is that the, the Zionists leaders, some of them, in Britain, a man named Chaim Weizmann, who is quite well known, went to the British government and said, well, we can help you win this war. Now, why would they want to do that? Because the war wasn't just against Germany, it was against the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire uh, held Palestine. Palestine was under, under the Ottoman Empire. So by defeating them, the British would, would come into control of, of Palestine. So the Zionists went to the British and said, we can help you get the United States into the war. Our, our Zionist colleagues in the United States, for example, they said in writing, Louis Brandeis, who is close to President Wilson, can help to do that. In exchange for that, the British did issue a declaration that was quite significant, mild as it may sound. It was really considered a gentleman's agreement. This is written about in a number of books, just most of us don't know this about our own history. So the Balfour Declaration was basically a promise that the British would help to facilitate the Zionist objective of creating a Jewish state in Palestine. After the British, of course, did win, then at the Paris peace talks, the Zionists pushed to uh, push this wording into the mandate in which Britain took charge of Palestine. Then jumping ahead to some of the American aspects again, 
Then we find during the 30s and the 40s, in Palestine itself, there were some, the violence increased. Naturally, as soon, you know, when there was colonization beginning around the turn of the century to a land with the intention of pushing out the land, the indigenous population at some point is going to wake out, wake up, and there will be violence. That has happened in the early 20s and again in 1929. There was violence between the two populations. Then, uh, then as now, the large number of those killed were the Palestinians. So as the violence increased, there were some terrorist organizations created in Palestine by the Zionists. One of them led by a former, in fact, two of them led by future Israeli prime ministers. And uh, those, those terrorist organizations in Palestine, the Irgun and the Stern Gang, it turns out had front groups in the United States with duplicitous names. And they were funneling massive amounts of money and weaponry to these terror groups in Palestine. They put on major pageants where Supreme Court justices attended and thousands of people attended. They were very prominent. One of them was led by a, a man named Peter Bergson, people thought. His real name was Hillel Cook. He was the operative for the Irgun. I looked into one of the leaders a bit more, just, just because I needed to find out his first name. When you're writing a book, you can't just write someone's last name, you need to know their first name. And I had heard about another leader of, of one of these types of front groups connected to killing in Palestine. And uh, his name was Rabbi Korf, but I didn't know the first name. None of the books that I had had a few paragraphs of them, but none of them gave his first name. So I looked into it on the internet, tried to do various searches, and eventually I came up with a UN report that gave his, his first name, Baruch Korf, and told a little bit about a plot he was part of. Using those search terms, I then could just, you know, put in more information into my search bar, and suddenly all these PDFs of American newspapers popped up, all of these returns. It turned out that Rabbi Baruch Korf was part of a, a, a cell in Paris that was planning to fly an airplane and bomb Britain after the war, Britain that had just defeated Hitler. But they were so angry at the British because the British were not allowing a, a large enough Jewish immigration into Palestine. So they were going to kill the British. So Baruch Korf and his section of the Stern Gang had this plan, but there was one problem. They, they didn't know how to fly an airplane. They weren't pilots. So they needed to find somebody, and they recruited a young American aviator named Reginald Gilbert, I discovered. Reginald Gilbert had been an ace during the war. He was in Paris, and they recruited him to fly the airplane for them. He pretended to go along with the plot, but then he went to the American Embassy, and the American Embassy ins informed the Paris police and Scotland Yard. So for a week, he pretended to go along with this cell, and then when it came time to actually take off, to fly the plane, to drop these uh, incendiary bombs onto the foreign ministry, they were caught. By the way, the original plan had been to bomb Parliament, but then they decided they hated the foreign ministry more. And Gilbert at one point had said to them, well, what if I can't find the foreign ministry in, in the London fog? They didn't have this you know, degree of instrumentation we have today, and that was a real possibility. And they said, then just drop them anywhere. Kill anybody. All, of, all British are our enemy. So they were caught. Korf was in prison for a few months in Paris, and he eventually got off. He had very powerful friends in the United States. But I was curious about him. I looked into him some more. To, you know, this was so astounding to me, and none of these you know, dozens and dozens of books I have, none of them had, any, had this story in there at all. And so in looking at him, I discovered that later in life, he was a friend of Richard Nixon. In fact, it was reported that he had helped to influence Nixon's policies on the Middle East. In fact, Nixon sort of in a fond way called him my rabbi. 
Now, the precursor to today's very powerful Israel lobby was a group called the American Zionist Emergency Council, AZEC. Uh, this was formed in around 1940, and by 1943 had a budget of half a million dollars at a time when a nickel bought a loaf of bread. Within a few years, they had maneuvered their way into access to an even far larger sum in which they had access to $14 million in 1941 and $150 million by 1948. That's the equivalent in today's dollars of a trillion dollars to use to manipulate the United States. So they targeted with that money every sector of US society. Uh, and you know this isn't ancient history. They had annual reports. They had directives. You know all of this was written down on paper. They targeted congressmen, Christian clergy, editors, professors, business and labor, Jewish war veterans. They published uh, books all over. They had 400 local committees. There were massive campaigns throughout the country. They also worked especially to manufacture Christian support. They uh, secretly funded sort of Christian groups that would push the same Zionist ideology. They uh, funded books that became huge bestsellers. It was a, an enormously successful campaign throughout the country. Even though during this time there was a great deal of opposition to Zionism by many different groups, by Christian leaders, by State Department, Pentagon, intelligence agencies, Jewish anti-Zionists, Many people were opposed to it. Two of the most celebrated Christian pastors opposed it on religious and moral grounds. Uh, the Christian leaders in the Middle East had gone to the Paris peace talks to advocate on behalf of the Arab population that there should be self-determination of peoples there. Uh, one very prominent American Christian who was a Dead Sea scholar wrote a wonderful book called Palestine is Our Issue, is Our Business. Uh, and, you know, it, it, to read that book, you, it, it's very strong. It talks about the right of return, about Palestinian resistance fighters, etc. But it was buried. Diplomats, the State Department, the military, the Pentagon, the intelligence agencies wrote directive after directive, study after study, memo after memo, talking about how damaging to the U.S. and to U.S. strategic interests and how in violation of American principles Zionism would be. Starting from under Taft, there was then a commission to, the, to Palestine during the time of the Paris peace talks. They went there to investigate the situation, to you know, look into the possibility of creating a Jewish state there. And they came back with a very powerful report saying this would be a grave trespass on the rights of the people there. This was entirely buried and uh, had no effect whatsoever. I'll skip through some of these people there in my book. Dean Acheson, a major statesman for many years, wrote that the Zionist agenda would imperil not only American but all Western interests in the Near East. The CIA wrote that they were pursuing objectives that would endanger the strategic interests of the Western powers in the Near and Middle East. There, there's so much evidence of, of this. You know, some people debate about whether the lobby is powerful. It's been powerful since the beginning, and the evidence is all there. It's just buried. Uh, Alfred Lilienthal was part of the American Council for Judaism. I had the honor of meeting him. He wrote excellent books about this. That group was, was arguing against Zionism. And part of what they were arguing in the State Department was that there would be massive bloodshed and chaos if this was pushed through. When the Zionists began to work to push through what's called the Partition Plan, through the United Nations, that's portrayed to Americans as this wonderful compromise. Palestinians just, you know, ignored this wonderful opportunity that Palestinians pushed through. Well, they, they knew, and the State Department were saying this would be a, a disaster if this gets pushed through. The idea was that the that Palestine, half of it would be given to a Jewish state even though these were mo mostly recently arrived and had originally only been 5% five of, the, of, the of the population. And even after decades of immigration, 
were 30% of the population. And this plan wasn't actually half. The plan was that they would get 55% of Palestine, approximately, and the Palestinians would get about 45% of their own land. Now, I know what the Americans would say if the UN did that to us, but this is portrayed with, oh, those foolish Palestinians not accepting that. Um, and by the way, the, many people are under the illusion that Israel bought up all that land. That's what's been told, and that was the attempt. And they did increase Jewish ownership about over, you know, from what was originally about 1% because it was so an urban population to at most 8%. Most historians said they owned about 5 to 6%. So a group that owned 8% under this plan was getting 55%, a good deal for them. No wonder they said they would go along with it and secretly in their journal said it's the first step, then we will get it all. But rather than bringing peace, which was what the UN was charged with, instead of bringing peace, it did the opposite. It created, of course, still more violence, and there was a war that Israel calls its War of Independence, and Palestinians call it Al-Nakba, the catastrophe, because it was a massive humanitarian catastrophe. At least three quarters of a million men, women, and children were very ruthlessly and violently pushed off their land. There were at least 16 massacres before a single Arab army finally joined the fray. And by the way, those of you that grew up with the myth that I did, that little Israel declared its independence and suddenly, you know, five to seven Arab armies suddenly just attacked, but Israel somehow won because God, you know, was on their side or something. Well, in reality, before Israel declared its independence on about May 14th, 15th, it's a midnight type of situation. They had already committed 16 massacres. These are quite grisly. You can read the details of them. They had already ethnically cleansed at least 200,000 people. When these Arab armies did come into the fray, they were smaller in number, including the Palestinian forces, than, than the Zionist forces were. And by the way, all, all, virtually all of the battles were actually fought on the part that, according to the UN plan, was going to be Palestinian territory. Now, some people, again, were trying to tell Americans what was going on. One of the most important was a woman named Dorothy Thompson. She was what the, Briti what the Britannica Encyclopedia says was one of the most famous journalists of the 20th century. In fact, I believe at one place they say that she is the most important female journalist of the 20th century. It's true, although I had never heard of her. She had a newspaper column that was printed all over the United States, a radio program that was listened to by millions of Americans. She was such a celebrity that there was a Broadway play in which she was, loose, she was played by Lauren Bacall, and there was a Hollywood movie loosely based on her life in which she was played by Katherine Hepburn. She was considered the most powerful woman in the United States after Eleanor Roosevelt. She was an excellent journalist. She had been a foreign correspondent in Germany during the 30s and had been one of the first journalists to raise the alarm about Hitler. She was the first foreign journalist to be expelled by Hitler. She was therefore very sympathetic to Zionism. But after the war, when Israel, when, you know, later when Israel began to be created, she went over to see this wonderful state of Israel, the new Jewish state. And when she got there, she saw hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees living in squalor, dying in large numbers every day. And she began to write of them, to tell about them, to speak about them. She even eventually made a documentary about them. And for telling about these people, for writing about these people, she lost her newspaper column, she lost her radio program, she lost her fame, and she was erased from history. This one is about something that took place on Capitol Hill in 2003. There was a briefing in the Rayburn House office building. The chairman of that briefing was a four-star admiral Admiral Thomas Moore, he had been 
chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a World War II hero, the highest rank a military officer can attain, really, and former chairman of Chiefs, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Also part of the panel was a rear admiral, Merlin Starring, who had been in charge of the whole legal department of the US Navy. Also part of their commission was a Marine general, and not just any Marine general, this one was the highest ranking Medal of Honor recipient in the United States, the highest medal of valor an American can win. They announced their findings on Capitol Hill that Israel had tried to set a sink a US Navy ship, that they had killed 34 Americans and injured over 170 of them, the decks had been running with blood, that rescue flights to these men had been recalled by order of the Secretary of Defense and the President of the United States. That this incident, in fact, had been ordered covered up by the President of the United States, and that this attack by Israel constituted an act of war against the United States by Israel. Statements of that gravity by officials of that high rank on Capitol Hill in a House office building are newsworthy. And yet, there was nothing about them in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the allegedly patriotic network, Fox News, we may wish to call why they didn't cover it. The only place that covered those statements was the Stars and Stripes newspaper. That's the military newspaper abroad. And it's in detail in the congressional record. There you can read every word. If I now tried to write an article, maybe about Dorothy Thompson, a fascinating person, or maybe about the Parashim, or maybe about Reginald Gilbert, there's much more I could tell you about, very interesting about him. If I tried to do that for a popular American history magazine, which I would like to do, I quite likely would not get it published. And that's, you know, this is not paranoid speculation. A few years ago, we tried to put a paid newspaper ad in American History Magazine, not about Palestine. We tried to put a paid ad in about a book, a memoir by a 91-year-old American congressman. It tells about his, his uh, childhood and depression era America, in Corn Belt America, about being a small town newspaper editor, about serving the Seabees during World War II, about going to Congress, about all his various fights in Congress, and about also, near the end of the book, it tells about the fact that when he started to speak about Palestine, he was targeted by the Israel lobby, money was funded to his opponent, and after 22 years in Congress, he lost the election, Paul Finley. But our advertisement didn't even tell about that last part of his very long life. It just told about his book, you know, with the usual blurbs about what a wonderful book this is. But Eric Weider, the publisher and owner of American History Magazine, informed us that they would not publish our advertisement in American History Magazine because we were anti-Israel, and that they would not publish our advertisement in any of the popular history magazines that they own in the United States, which is virtually every one. This is, according to their website, the largest history chain in the world, and it's certainly the largest one in the United States. So what do we do about this? To me, we tell people what's going on, we even talk to those people that we don't want to raise something serious or uncomfortable with. Because right now, as we're talking, we all know what's going on in Gaza. In general, we don't know which child was just killed or lost their parents. We don't know which home was just destroyed, which hospital was further destroyed. But we know what's going on right now. And now we, we know a little bit about what's going on here but we have the power to change this. I feel strongly that if every single person in the United States right now that is concerned about Gaza would actually just do something like maybe again, or maybe for the first time, 
phone your senator. If every single one of us did that tomorrow, it wouldn't change the policy overnight, but they would have, they have their fingers to the wind and suddenly they would realize, whoa, looks like the tide is changing here. And half of them would love it to change. They don't like being APAC puppets. Now some of them are ideological Zionists. You know, that, that's the reality. But according to a congressman that I talked to a number a few years ago, he said over half in Congress know what they are doing is wrong, but the Israel lo they're afraid of the Israel lobby. In other cases, Congress people have privately told individuals, you need to make me do this. You need to create the grassroots movement so that I can do it. If everyone in America did that, it would begin the impact that would bring change. Thank you very much.